Mr. Puri, you know, if you speak with global CEOs today, while they talk about the opportunities that India presents and they talk about uh, the, the headroom for potential growth from here, I think one of the things that is weighing on uh, CEOs and global boards today uh, is the geopolitical risk. And many argue that India perhaps is better placed today from a geopolitical standpoint, given what's happening between Russia and Ukraine and now what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, as economic, uh, uh, geoeconomics and geopolitics gets converged more so, what do you believe will have to be India's position as we move forward? Let's separate the two. One is the content of the bilateral relationship, and the other is the evolving uh, geopolitical situation. When you come to this terrorist atrocity, it's nothing other than that, by Hamas, there was not a moment's hesitation. I think the Prime Minister came out right up front immediately and talked about us and where we stood with Israel. So that's, it. that's the distance we've traveled. Insofar as the geopolitical situation is concerned, I have a slightly more orthodox view, and I uh, look at it from the um, energy sector and other parts of the economic interaction. I think the fundamental thing is that the multilateral institutions which were de designed in 1945 to deal with a situation which was A, post-war reconstruction, B, to the victor belong the spoils, that is the countries which were on the winning side would be permanent members of the Security Council, and C, which was a question of an intellectual compatibility between people who met in that uh, sleepy um, uh, village in New Hampshire called Britain Woods and uh, designed the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and so on. We've traveled from there. I think, in fairness to those who um, have stepped on the gas and wanted an acceleration of the content and the nature of the bilateral relationship, the India-US civil nuclear um, deal was one such event. Uh, I went full marks, the then Prime Minister was willing to stake the future of his government uh, uh, to get that deal through, even though I don't think we've done a dollar worth of uh, contracting underneath, but that's a separate issue. Today, I think the nature of the relationship, what it is today, I'm not measuring it in terms of that figure you gave me, $192 billion. Shireen, I am always one of those who has a you know, standard, state, standard line in any such statement that this is still, it still waits to be fully exploited and worked, and I genuinely believe that. I think the United States and India are two countries which have so much going for each other that if the geopolitical turmoil in increases, then the potential for that bilateral relationship, in fact, increases. It is on many fronts. And I can um, uh, think, I think the CEOs, when you name it, uh, the other day, uh, somebody sent me a list of 25 CEOs of Indian origin. I was very carefully going through that. That's the 26th I found. You know, I said the new Honeywell CEO is also um, yes. You know, so I see all my friends sitting here. Look, that is traditional, that will grow, but I think the abiding, the, the important feeling I get is that there is a loss of inhibition and hesitation. And I think we have shed that inhibition some time ago. I find the United States also will sh willing to reciprocate, and I want to be uh, the devil's advocate. If not India, who? I mean, yeah, you have other choices to get into, but the kind of uh, uh, depth and diversity and across uh, economic sectors in terms of future and technology, what have you. Um, I think um, the experiences of the last few years, um, whatever, I'm not getting into any uh, discussion on that kind, but those will enhance and strengthen the imperative of taking the bilateral relationship to newer heights. 
Well, speaking of taking the bilateral relationship to new heights in the context of what you believe has been this uh, shedding of inhibitions and a sort of uh, new confidence on both sides, outside of the traditional areas, and I, I listed out a whole bunch of new areas where this partnership is hoping to uh, forge greater potential, uh, what is it that you would like both sides to focus on? Uh, there has been significant movement specifically on the defense side, much to the surprise of people who were looking at this development closely. Where do you believe uh, we could potentially see uh, accelerated movement? Look, I think the areas have been identified. They find um, resonance in the joint statements, if you should. You mentioned some of them. I'm not the line minister, so I think it will be completely um, uh, wrong for me to do some prioritization of my own. I think that's for the external affairs ministry, those who deal with foreign and security policy to do. But as a line minister in two in ministries which have solid economic content, I will, I'm seeing things happen which I never could uh, uh, visualize earlier. Um, well, even on energy, I mean, um, I don't think our total bilateral relationship was $20 billion when you and I were on the desk. Uh, today we buy $20 billion of energy from the U.S. per year. And um, the U.S. has a different approach to issues relating to energy than OPEC does. And uh, I don't see any hesitation on our side or their side to uh, pushing that forward. When we started talking about the Biofuels Alliance, the, one of the strongest supporters was um, Secretary Granholm. Um, when we talk about green hydrogen, mm. she has been one of the strongest uh, advocates. In my first conversation with her after I was associated with the Petroleum and Natural Gas Ministry. I'm talking about July 21. The first very meeting, she put green hydrogen up front. Uh, I'm very often invited with an attempt to provoke me to comment on something called an Inflation Reduction Act. Yes, I was about to get said, to yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll anticipate you're asking me, and I'll say I'm not going to get provoked. It's entirely... I mean, whether that is viewed as a charge on the state exchequer and you want to call it a subsidy, I'm not getting into that. I am one of those who's wedded to a movement away from fossil fuels, and I think green hydrogen is the fuel of the future. So if I see a situation in which a country as important as the United States, both for strategic and other reasons, is going to put in how many? A couple of hundred billion dollars mm -hmm. more, okay, into that. But I have a different approach. I say I want my companies to take advantage of that. What do you need to do green hydrogen? You need to have clean, um, cheap uh, solar energy. We've demonstrated that we can bring the price of a unit down from 25 cents to 3 cents a unit. We've done that. And you need electrolyzers. And I think the government has been upfront. We have got electrolyzers included in the PLI. I have a lot of companies who are getting investment in from all over the place. And I conclude by saying green hydrogen will succeed where there is demand where there is local production and there is consumption. And I can't think of too many countries other than the United States and India where that is likely to happen. Because the gas does not lend itself to transportation. You can take green ammonia as we are exporting to Unipar in Germany or to Singapore for their new GE electric, uh, electricity plant. But otherwise what you require is local consumption. And that is what is happening. Uh, by the way, I mean, I can be a little naughty and say, if you subsidize green hydrogen, send us some of your subsidized green <laughs> hydrogen. I'm, I'll be happy to uh, get our companies to uh, take advantage. But, you know, that's another kind of discussion. Sure. Uh, well, you know, we will talk about uh, uh, the, the many changes that we're seeing as far as the energy transition is concerned, and I'll revisit that issue in just a second. But, Ed Knight, let me talk to you about the opportunities that have opened up from an India perspective and potential areas of collaboration for the U.S. I mean, the Indian capital markets have deepened and deepened quite significantly. Even on the bond market side, India has just been included, the Indian bonds included in the J.P. Morgan uh, uh, Emerging Market Bond Index. Uh, derivative volumes, India today, the highest. How how do you see the opportunities opening up for both sides? Uh, one thing I would emphasize that the Honorable Minister, and it's an honor to be with you at this stage and with Atoll and with all of you, uh, is the personal element of this. And we talk about a partnership, but it's more than that. It's a friendship between the two countries. 
And one of the things we are very focused on at the USIBC under a tools leadership is building trust because the relationship is really not going to deepen unless that trust is there. But we have something that's very unique here, what I'd call the diaspora dividend. Mm -hmm. When COVID hit your country so hard, I saw a reaction from the American business community that really surprised me overnight. And I asked myself, why is every CEO on this conference call trying to figure out how we can do more to help our friends in India? And it's because those friends are in India, but they're also at our companies. There's Sanjit and Ardi and Nipun at NASDAQ who are my friends who are Indian. And when I think of India, I think of them. And it is a special relationship. It doesn't exist in a bilateral way between U.S. business and other countries in that our employees, our colleagues are Indians, and we feel a connection, a DNA that doesn't exist in other relationships. And that trust is something that's very important to NASDAQ. Our market would not operate every morning with millions of people coming together unless people trusted our technology. Uh, these markets are advancing very quickly. Uh, they are with AI, the cloud, and other uh, new technologies. Uh, we want to work with India on how they can deepen their market, how they can capitalize their, com their companies uh, in a more efficient way. Um, we want to supply data to these markets, which is really the lifeblood. You talk about the bond index, mm -hmm. that data that J.P. Morgan distributed created opportunities and information that drives the creation of a deeper bond market in Indian sovereign debt. I think uh, Jamie Dimon estimated yeah. it at $25 billion. Yeah, that's right. And so it's that sort of collaboration uh, that I see happening in the financial markets around the cloud, artificial intelligence, there's going to be a whole new generation of data centers around the world. And to uh, enable artificial intelligence applications. But those data centers are going to probably have an element of sovereignty involved mm. in them uh, because they're going to be so critical to the economies where they're located. And you're going to have to work in partnership with government and with local partners to build those and to take technology to the next level, take markets to the next level. Uh, we're excited about that, and USIBC is at the front line of that. Well, I, I'll talk about the pipeline that's likely to be exploited to try and get Indian companies to list on the NASDAQ as well. But uh, Ambassador Kashyap, let me come to you now to talk about the unique opportunities with, that both uh, uh, Minister Puri as well as Ed Nitra spoke of and the sweet spot that we find India and the U.S. in and this trusted partnership that is developing. Uh, technology, of course, has been the big area of collaboration and partnership, but manufacturing more so, especially in the context of China plus one or who but India in Minister Puri's words. Uh, you know, what could be the accelerant there that you would like to emphasize? Uh, Shirinji, thank you very much. And um, what a great panel to be on. I feel very privileged. Um, I'm always intimidated when I appear in public with Minister Hardeep Singh Puri. It's, uh, it's kind of like uh, having a student uh, appear in front of a master and hope to pass the exam. But uh, I'm joined here by a lot of distinguished colleagues from the Indian Foreign Service. Greetings to both of you. And of course, colleagues from the US government, Arun Kumar, and others from the American Embassy. Uh, and uh, it reminds me of something. You know, a long time ago when I was a kid, I would come here to India from Africa. My dad was posted in the UN in Africa. And we'd come home every year, and home was in two directions. One was to Paniput, where my grandmother lived. And the other was in Newport News, Virginia, where my other grandmother lived. And the itinerary was always the same, Africa to India to Europe to Vienna, and then down to the States to Newport News and back home. Leaving Africa after a year out there, all of my clothes were tattered and torn. You know, all of our electronics were junk. And we'd come home to India, and people wanted everything, 
everything. Give me your jeans. Oh, I can't give you my jeans. I don't have any to fly, to fly to the next place. And it reminds me of how much desperation there was in an economy that was very different from what it is today. We had the uh, chief economic advisor of India give us a presentation today to the board. India's economy is booming. It is sizzling. It is the envy of the entire world. What's the point about the tattered, faded, old blue jeans? I'm going to get to the point. The other day, I took my daughter to go buy a phone in Clarendon in Arlington, Virginia. And the fella gave us the phone, and there it said, designed by Apple in California and built in India. And I thought, holy moly, here we go. You know, like this is India rock and roll. This is India building up ahead of steam to resume its rightful place as generating as much as a quarter or a third of global input. And it's truly a heartwarming moment for someone like me, who's Indian American and who's lived through that era of desperation and, and poverty and frankly, stagnation. It's one of the reasons my dad left India in 1958. He had no choices. A young Indian today has more choice than almost any young person on earth. And the possibility that this country is gonna grow by leaps and bounds is truly inspiring. So on manufacturing, I feel like the government of India has put in sustained focus and sustained effort to harmonize its rules and regulations, to look at ease of doing business, level playing field, regulatory predictability and coherence, and also to reach out to the companies and bring them in and invite them and say, all right, tell us what you need. Let's see what we can do. Now, doing that in a complicated, layered, um, uh, diverse democracy is always tough. But India has absolutely pulled it off. And I think given the geostrategic tensions and given the fact that the United States and India are the two largest members of a community of high trust societies, free high trust societies, I think you're going to see a lot more manufacturing in India. Personally, as an American, I hope a lot of that happens in America too. And I think that if we can spark manufacturing in America and India, it's going to be better for all of our citizens, frankly, better for people all around the world, better for our economic freedom and sovereignty, and of course, will lift people to new standards of prosperity. So I'm very optimistic. I commend the government of India on what they've done. I want to see even more of that. And I think US IBC companies are playing an absolutely leading role in trying to drive that manufacturing to high trust societies.